Okay, let's read this text. It says, therefore, brothers, and Barry, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I have the clicker. Um, I told him, I said, I need some other things for stimulation today. <laughs> uh, so let me have the, the clicker. So hopefully I can uh, get my brain moving. Okay, therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. And we talked briefly last week that we have a new obligation, and it's to respond to the love of our Father and to the grace of God. How are you glad you're indebted now to God? <laughs> and his debt is not a crushing one. It's not one where he is there trying to make sure that you pay it back. But no, it's a, it's a debt of grace. It's an obligation to respond to his love. And so it says, we are obligated no longer to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because, why will you live? How will you live? Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. But you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, or Papa, or Daddy, Father. The Holy Spirit gives us a whole new spiritual vocabulary. A vocabulary a vocabulary of sonship. The Spirit himself witnesses or testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Now last week what we did was we said that there are three major progressive stages of the Spirit-led life. And the first one that we unpacked last week, because we had just a kind of a very short period of time because of all the things in the service, is we just tried to focus in on that one simple first stage that the Holy Spirit, as he begins to say, you are a child of God, I'm here as your divine mentor, you cannot go where the Father wants to take you. You cannot follow in the footsteps of Jesus unless I begin to take the controls. And so last week we talked about how the first stage of a spirit-led life, a faith-filled life, is the surrendering of our controls because we want to try to manage our own happiness. We want to minimize risk to avoid pain. We want to do all those things we can because Fear has been our mentor. Fear has been our teacher. What we've done is we're afraid of loss. We're afraid of making mistakes. We're afraid of that punitive damage that comes when we make a mistake and things that we are clinging to disappear. We lose them. And, uh, and, and many of us have watched things that we were dreaming for, hoping for, just evaporate, dissipate when we made a mistake and we blew it. And we've lost uh, relationships, and we've lost money, and we've lost things because uh, we, we made mistakes and we lived according to the law of sin, which produced death in our life. And last week we quoted that scripture out of Galatians, that the wages, or excuse me, we reap what we sow. And if you sow to the flesh, and the flesh being controlled and dominated by fear you will ultimately reap a corrupting effect in your life. And so what it does is fear teaches us to cling even tighter, to hold on to things even tighter. And it's counterintuitive, but the Holy Spirit comes and he pries our hands off of what we are clinging to. Because many of those things, we love them, but they become idols to us. They become these props and to be the way it is. And he said, I love you. Matter of fact, that's what I'm here to demonstrate to you, to show you, to communicate. I come into this house because I wanted to be with my friends. But how how does that moment happen where you're in a home with your friends, you're there to show them how much you love them, and ultimately one is getting it and the other one is so disconnected, it's because of fear. A spirit of bondage again to fear. 
And so Jesus had to reconnect her heart. But this is what he said to Martha in the end. He said, only one thing is needed. And only one thing will remain. And so I've said this, and I'll say it to all of us. There is no title that you have right now. There is no ministry that you're serving in that you're not going to one day have to give it up. There'll, there'll be a day when I've preached my last message. And if my identity has been rooted, Josh, don't you say amen. <laughs> All of a sudden, Josh got a big smile and he looked over his mouth. Can't wait for that day. No, I'm just teasing him. But if I have rooted my identity in that I can get up every Sunday and preach to people, and that's where my identity is, and I, I like the feeling that I have when I get up and do this, and I like to hear people laugh, and I like to see people engaged, and I like to see people changed by the power of the Word. If I, my identity is based on me being a preacher, then when it all fades away, because there will be a day where I preach my last message and I will no longer be able to get up with a conscious stream, a stream of consciousness to be able to articulate the Word of God. There'll be a day when my wife will come up to me and she'll say, it's all right, honey, come on down. You need to let somebody else get in the saddle. If I'm not willing to hold it all loosely... If your job is, and your career is what you hold so tightly to because it makes you have that inner sense of value, that this is who I am, this is my identity, it will all fade away, it will all be taken away, but the thing that will not be taken away from you is your relationship with Jesus <laughs> and how he defines you in him. And he says, I want to be in you and I want you to be in me and, and I am taking two and I'm making them one and what God has joined together, let no man ever separate you. Amen. And I know that's a metaphor that we use when we marry people, but there is a larger context to that. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So I'm the Lord's, I'm my beloved and he is mine and his banner over me is love. That's who I am. That's how he's defined me. Right now, in the realm of the Spirit, God is walking and escorting you all around with a banner and a sign over you. Amen. And it doesn't say loser. It says, this is the one I love. I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you right now, if we could only see ourselves the way God sees us, if we could only see ourselves the way we look in the realm of the Spirit, we would see that the Lord has put angelic guardians around us. We would see just what the disciples saw when Jesus was transfigured before them, said that his raiment was, was translated and, 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 and it appeared as the whitest of any clothing that was bleached brighter than any clothing could be bleached white. Amen. There's a radiance about you. There is a beauty about you. There is a glory. You are clothed with garments of salvation and righteousness. Yes. And so the Lord wants us to go and walk this way as if it really is a reality. Yes. That's the tension of faith. That's the mystery of faith. I, can, I don't see how radiant I am. I don't see how glorious I am. I don't see that he's put this spirit, a spirit of adoption in me. I can't quantify that because I can't see spiritually this capacity that he's put within me to contain the glory of God because it's now hidden in a jar of clay. But one day the, the, the clay jar is going to be broken. <laughs> And out will come the radiant beauty and the glory of the Lord that will be revealed in us. And that's what he, Paul said in this chapter. He said, listen, we, 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 we've got to be willing as he tutors us and mentors us by the Spirit and leads us into sonship. We've got to be willing to walk through the sufferings in this world and respond to God through them so that the glory that he wants us to share will be revealed in us. Because I find that the glory comes out 
when there is this pressure that's put to bear that squeezes it to the surface. Okay, so we have talked about surrendering the control to God. Now this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the second stage, uh, and, it, and it is a progression of the next stage that the Lord, once we are willing to surrender, once we're willing to be vulnerable to trust God, and we're willing to stop clinging to the things that are our idols and our crutches, and step by step, we begin to just say, Lord, I am yours. Here am I, Lord. Here am I. I surrender it, and I'm going to give you the controls of my life. There's a second stage, and that is that the Lord will require you to step out of what we call the comfort zone, and that's become a very familiar phrase in the body of Christ. Once we surrender the controls to Him, the Holy Spirit is going to be a mentor that will begin to take you out of that which you're comfortable with. And the way I want to state this point of coming out of the comfort zone is I want to state it this way. I say the second stage is to get comfortable with the uncomfortable and become familiar with the unfamiliar. I'm going to say that one or two more times because it is, according to my biological clock, 8.15, all right? The second stage in development of a spirit-led life. First, there is this thing of surrender. And once the Holy Spirit says, let me pry from you your crutches and your idols, and I want you to trust me that I have your best interest at heart. There are things that I want for you more than you want them. And you're going to come to to value things in the future that you really don't value right now. But if you'll let me lead you where I want to take you, it's going to be real good. But once we surrender the controls, the second step is the Holy Spirit will begin to liberate you from the prison which you've lived in. Now, you think that that prison is not a prison. You call it a comfort zone. It's a place that gives you great security. Because it's something that you can manage. It's something that you can emotionally manage. It's something that you you feel like, well, if I stay in this place, even though this is not really good, but there are things that are out there that could be bad and risky, and I'm not willing to risk it all, so I just stay here. And I'm going to manage my expectations. And the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to get you out of that prison that you made for yourself, and I'm going to get you out of your comfort zone. Now, I want you to turn in your scriptures to this passage of scripture in John chapter 3. And uh, again, I've said that the second stage is where the Holy Spirit wants you to get comfortable with those things that are uncomfortable, and he wants you to get familiar with living in the unfamiliar. The faith-filled walk, the Spirit-led life, is a walk where God is going to lead you into the unknown. He's going to lead you to live life by that which is unseen. So it's unknown, and only God knows it, and He wants to reveal it to you. But again, this is why we want to minimize the risk, and the Holy Spirit is saying, Trust me with the controls. I can get you where I want you to go. I can get you over mountains that you couldn't climb over. I can get you through valleys that you couldn't cross. I can get you across bodies of water that you couldn't swim across. you got to trust me. I can get you there. And I know that everything in your flesh wants to scream, this is too scary. But you have a choice. And that the church in the West is really at a crossroads right now. Either we're going to live this comfortable, cultural, Christian life where we define our Christianity as showing up to a time slot on Sunday morning and having my pew or my padded chair, and it is boring and it is monotonous. I thought you would say amen. If that's all there is, yes, it becomes boring and monotonous. But the Holy Spirit has so much more for us than attending meetings. 
This is to be just the refilling station where we come and, and we share testimonies and we worship our God in unity and we get encouraged and, and equipped. But really, church is the rest of the week. You know, and, and sometimes I think that there are leaders that think that if we can create the perfect service where like, uh, you know, in, in the Olympics, where, you know, we can get the perfect 10, the perfect service, then somehow then we've had revival. No, revival happens out there. I find, matter of fact, when Christianity becomes contagious out there, you have revival on the inside of where the people gather. Because they come back and their hearts are so full and they're testifying of what God has done in and through them. So I want to, you know, this is not for me to discourage you from attending church, believe me. <laughs> but that's only one small facet of being the church. People talk about, well, I want to see the gifts of the Spirit. If the Western church would get this, that the gifts of the Spirit are, yes, to be used among the body of Christ when it's assembled, but primarily the gifts and the manifestations are for, for when the church is sent out into the community. That's right. Amen. He wants you to be functioning in prophecy. He wants you to be functioning in words of knowledge, words of wisdom, discerning of spirit, spirits. He wants you to function in the working of miracles, the gifts of healing. Now, we want, we want to practice working models here. We want you to be trained in how to minister in the gifts of the Spirit. And there is no safer place than to do it in the church among friends. To where if you make a mistake or say the wrong thing, you know, you're not going to be judged because we're not, there's not a litmus test on how you're praying, and you, you don't have to have the perfect 10 of the perfect prayer. And sometimes the churches have been that type of an experience where we are so nervous about experimenting and taking steps of faith and exploring the things of God and moving in the Spirit that we are afraid that everybody else is there having a judgment card up there. Well, I only say that's a four. <laughs> that message is a four. This is what the church can turn into when the church is not doing the stuff on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We turn into just a bunch of experts that are educated above our level of obedience and we think our job as Christians is to come judge whether the pastor's sermon was powerful enough to motivate you to come back next week. It's true. And so after church, we'll go have a meal and we'll talk about, well, the worship team is kind of off today. <laughs> oh, oh you, the preacher's message wasn't... <laughs> The preacher's message, you know, didn't get me where I needed to go this week. And, uh, you know, he looked kind of tired today. No kidding. You know, or somebody gets up and shares the testimony. Well, I, they could have said it this way or they could have. And I'm all about improving. I'm all about saying, let's go for excellent. But we've got to have a laboratory right here where the, where the youngest believer can begin to explore being led by the Holy Spirit into the powerful realities of the kingdom of God. And this is not about just a few qualified professionals that get up and entertain you. This is about the body being equipped to do the stuff. I love that. This is about being an army of God that goes out and know, knows how to prevail against the strongholds of hell. Amen. It really is. Because you are somebody. We already saying that. You are somebody. You're loved by God. God has not cheated you or robbed you. He has made you an inheritor of the kingdom. He's more He's made you more than a conqueror. And you know what the difference is between a conqueror and someone that's more than a conqueror? The conqueror is the, the uh, boxer that gets in the ring and he goes 10 rounds and wins the heavyweight championship. And he, he holds the belt up and he celebrates. And he is now the grand champion. Every other opponent has been defeated and he's knocked them out. And now he's known as the champion. Who is more than the conqueror is the wife of the champion. Who, when he gets the 
check cut for the millions of dollars for getting into that arena and conquering his foe. The wife says, honey, you hand me the check. The boxer is the, is the, the conqueror. The wife becomes more than a conqueror because she gets the inheritance that came from the conquest. And he said, you are, a, you are a child of God, therefore you are an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. Amen. He is an all-conquering king, conquering death, hell, and the grave. And now you and I, after he's gone before us and he has broken the power of the enemy, there is this inheritance which he has received that he turns around and said, I fought for this, but you don't have to. That's right. Amen. <laughs> It was blood, it was sweat, it was tears. I fought, I prevailed, I received an inheritance. This earth is now the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The devil tried to take it, but I've come and I've taken it back. What Adam lost, I have reclaimed it for you. Now you don't have to be controlled by fear, fear of loss, fear of death any longer. I want you to stand up and I want you to act like an overcomer. I want you to act like a son and daughter of God. I want you to stand up and be who I've made you to be in me. But this battle does not have to be fought twice. Here, I fought for it. It is yours. Now live in the reality of it. Okay. I've got to go quicker. We're in John chapter 3, aren't we? Now, I want us to pay particular attention to this passage of Scripture because this Scripture tells us what the Spirit-led life looks like. And it goes against everything conventional wisdom teaches us. Jesus answered and he said, Very, very truly, I tell you. And, And in the King James, it's verily, verily. And that means if anything is true, this is true. This is what Jesus said. If anything is true, this is true. Very truly, I tell you. No one can enter the kingdom unless they are born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but Spirit gives birth to Spirit. I want you to hear that truth. That the Holy Spirit has given birth to you. And you are now no longer defined by your flesh. You're a spirit. Therefore, you can be led by the Spirit. You can walk in the Spirit. You can be empowered by the Spirit to do powerful things. He says, you should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. But this is the metaphor that Jesus uses. He talks about the Holy Spirit being like the wind. The wind blows wherever it pleases. He says, you hear its sound but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. And what Jesus is saying in this passage is he said that the wind, you only see its effects. It's hard to say, where did this gust of wind come from? And you wonder how long these winds can be sustained. So I talk to my mom and dad sometimes, and they're in Indiana, and one of the first things you do when you talk to people from another state, what's the first level of con- conversation? After you ask them, how are you doing, mom and dad? You want to just say, what's the weather down there? Because you're hoping somebody's experiencing better weather than you are. Right. It's kind of like a thread of hope, right? Yeah. It's kind of just like a line of hope, a, a line of credit of hope that is out there. So I'll ask them, I'll say, what's the temperatures like there, you know? And this is just me being a former Hoosier that lived many years in Indiana. And I'm just saying, vicariously, if the weather is warmer than it is in Iowa, I'm going to vicariously live in warmer weather through you, Mom and Dad. Tell me. Tell me that it's springtime in Indiana. And my Mom and Dad will give me this weather update. And sometimes they'll tell me, they'll say, hey, It's cloudy, or it was real windy today, or it was rainy today, or the sun was shining. And sometimes the wind or the weather will be the same there as it is here in Iowa. But it's amazing. 
Nine times out of ten, the weather is entirely different. South to north, east to west. Here are all these wind currents and changes in the jet stream. And it seems like it has a mind of its own, doesn't it? Even in localized weather. Some people will be getting the roofs blown off of their house on the north side and on the south side. Nobody saw any wind or its effects. On the south side, you'll have two inches of rain. You talk to somebody on the north side. Man, that was bad rain, wasn't it? Really? We didn't have any rain. How is that? Well, Jesus said, hey, the weather is a metaphor for the activity of the Holy Spirit. He said, you can see the results of the impact of it after it's come through. But you didn't know where it was coming from, and you don't know how long it's going to last. You don't know where it's going. But he said, so is the activity of the Holy Spirit. But then this is how Jesus ended that teaching with Nicodemus. Somebody get ready to shout. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. If you are born of the Spirit, you are now Spirit. Therefore, you take upon the nature of the Spirit. And a part of the nature of the Spirit is He is unpredictable. (laughs) Oh my, I enjoy teaching on this stuff so much. (laughs) Because what it does is that what I'm trying to do this morning is saying, He's going to take you out of your comfort zone. Not me, Lynn, not me. He's not going to get me out of I, I. I've surrendered my life to Jesus, but I'm staying right here. Oh, no, you're not. Dorothy, you're not going to be in Kansas any longer. You're not. Because there is a storm coming, and it's a Holy Spirit storm. Where all of a sudden the wind of God begins to circulate once you've been born again. There is this circulation of the wind of the Spirit that begins to come around your life. And all of a sudden you begin to get free from the gravitational pull of the earth that says you got to just live like a mere human being. He said, no, I'm going to carry you on the wind of the Spirit. And I'm going to take you to places that you never dreamed you were going to go. And to those that only have carnal thinking and natural mind, you're going to look unpredictable. You're even going to look in their eyes unstable. They're going to label you as a little off in the head. They really are. They're going to say, what what are they doing? Why did they do that? There's going to be moments in life where your normal pattern of life is stopped on a dime and you turn and you go seemingly a different direction than you had communicated that you were going to go. Come on, let's quote this together just to make us feel good about the journey. (laughs) Because the Holy Spirit is saying, no, 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 I'm not going to have you drive on the interstate anymore. Get off this exit now. I'm going to take you the scenic route. (laughs) I'm going to take you the scenic route, and it's going to be windy. It's going to be curvy. It's not going to be the straightest uh, uh, line is, you know, between two points directly to each other. No, your life to the natural man may look like, you know, wavy, curvy, intricate. It may look like a bowl of spaghetti, but the Lord says, I have a plan in mind. So let's quote it together. So it is with everyone that is born of the Spirit. Turn the person beside of you and say, now I know why you're weird. (laughs) Okay, quickly. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9 says, "Um, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. That's why we have to have the renewed mind. Neither are your ways my ways. This requires great humility for us to grasp this passage. But again, I have these 
grains and grooves and encoded, you know, rock beds of thinking that, that I think that has got me to where I am today. And, but the Holy Spirit says, no, I'm going to take that hardened thinking, that bedrock of the way you think, and I'm going to begin to change it. I'm going to, I'm going to t- remove out of you the, heart of the, rigidity, the rigidity of the heart of stone that you have. It says, I will not be, I will not be moved. And God says, I'm going to take and I'm going to put within you a spirit and a heart that is sensitive to my leadership. And I'm going to, you're going to begin to comprehend my ways and my thoughts. For they're higher. It says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so when it looks like my life is filled with random directions... And when it looks like the Holy Spirit is leading me one way and then shifts me and goes in a different direction, I may not be able to comprehend why God is doing what He is doing in my life, but I don't have to know everything. I'm going to read you a quote by Charles Spurgeon. And uh, Charles Spurgeon was preaching and teaching out of a text about how the disciples were on the Sea of Galilee and they, in the middle of the night, they were caught in the storm. And Jesus came walking out on the water to them. And he stepped in and he calmed the sea. But the Bible says they were exhausted from rowing. And I taught on this in, in, in the Gospel of Mark on Wednesday night. But Charles Spurgeon said, Oh, for the grace to feel that if we do not know when God will deliver us, we can accept then that is none of our business. When I read that quote from Charles Spurgeon, it was like, you go, Charles. <laughs> but I feel like God does want to say sometimes, because we, we think that the more information we have, the more obedient we will be. I found, find out that the more informed we are, we begin to see that if we knew what God was going to do in and through us, and he informed us of everything that's ahead of us, we would not be obedient. Because we would try to manage the risk. Because we would go, I am terrified. Okay. He says, if God doesn't tell you when he's going to deliver you, you must accept that it is none of your business. If God knows, then it is enough. We are to follow him, not lead. We are to obey him, not prescribe to him. Oh, know that your deliverance near, but if it tarries, it will be a greater blessing. And so then this is what he said. He said, so row on. Even if you are in contrary winds, even if you're in difficulty, even if you don't know why God has allowed you to go through the pressure-filled experience you're in. Row on, my friend, because God knows how to get you to the other side. I think I'm waking up. So God, through the Holy Spirit and his mentorship in our life, will progress us to a stage where not only do we trust in him and surrender the controls, that we begin to allow him to take us out of the comfort zone. And this is what he will do. He will overthrow the conventional wisdom that we have so rooted our life in. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attack two points of conventional wisdom that we all live by. Yeah. Most of our life is lived by cliches that comes from common sense and conventional wisdom. Now, I believe in common sense. But there is a common sense that creates a conventional wisdom where we tell everybody what the norm is. If you follow this, you'll be normal. (laughs) It's keeping it between the lines. It's playing it safe. It won't attract attention from the IRS. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm talking about? We want to keep our head low. And so I joke with all my buddies, and you've probably heard me say this to some of the men of the church. I'll say, good, uh, there's two things that I will say to guys to cause them to chuckle. I like to make people chuckle. 
Do you know I like to make you chuckle? I do. I want to be a joy giver, not a joy taker. And so if we've had lunch together, if we have had a meeting and I know you and you're open to my sense of humor, I'll tell you two things. I'll say, be good, if not, invite me. And it's a way I do kind of a pastoral check on your (laughs) well-being. Because if you then say, well, next Friday, then I'm going to have a meeting with you on Thursday, okay? But the other thing that I will say is this old kind of uh, pioneer, you know, early American phrase. I'll say, my friend, keep your head down and your powder dry. Because I know that there's a lot of warfare out there. So I'll say, keep your head low. Well, that's what we do. It's kind of a conventional wisdom. You know, don't take any risk. Manage your risk. Play it safe. There's a conventional wisdom. The two I want to talk about is we are told most of the time that if you play, if you're going to play, play to your No, you play to your strength. And so I believe that there is an element of truth in this that, you know, you want to you want to match your gifting and your passions to the job that you do. But there is a thing where we say play to your strengths. But what we're really saying when we state that is we're saying we want you to play it as safe as possible. So we take a phrase play to your strength and we say play it safe to where there's no risk involved in your life. In other words, you're not going to be involved in something where you don't have the opportunity to fail or to look bad in trying to succeed. If this conventional wisdom is true, that we're to play to our strength, then Moses never would have went to the court of Pharaoh and declared the word of the Lord to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. Because Moses was not an orator. He was not strong in speaking. Can you imagine him thinking about going before the ruling empire's king at that time and standing up there and having this fear of, I'm going to get up there and I'm just going to stutter in front of this man. Now, in our conventional wisdom, we want to say, hey, We're going to confront Pharaoh, and we're going to place a mandate and a demand on him that that the slavery and the bondage that he has had over the people of God, that he's going to have to change his ways, and God is confronting him. So we want to send the best speaker possible to lay out the case in front of Pharaoh and demand that he let the people of God go. Sounds good? Let's vote on that. How many of you want the, the most articulate, bold speaker Somebody that's a a high-priced lawyer to represent us. Everybody in the church would vote yes. Now let's think about the guy that struggles with a speech impediment and he stutters. And I get the high-priced lawyer that has, you know, just, he's a great orator. He, He knows argument. And then I put the stutter up and I say, hey, before we take the vote, Five minutes, we want you to just share why you should represent us in the court of Pharaoh. And the lawyer gets up and he begins to just, you know, orate and begin to articulate with great conciseness and clarity the reason why it's not right for the people of God to stay in slavery. And we all say, I want him. That's the one I choose. Lord, have mercy, he's good. If I would have been in the jury, the jury, I would have been convinced. Man, this guy is a professional. And then we have the stutterer get up there and he he goes up and says, all I have is staff. Gave me. How many of you want to change your vote? And so Moses said, I can't do it. He said, No, this is not going to be upon your eloquency. 
This is going to be upon the power of God. And just so you can feel a little comfortable in that place of discomfort that I'm sending you to, I'm going to send your brother along, and when you're stammering where you can't get it out, he'll tell Pharaoh what you mean to say to him. Come on, brothers and sisters, that is good. So he's in Pharaoh's court, and he's going... And Aaron says... My brother wants to tell you you're in big trouble. <laughs> step to step to God. God's going to use the staff on you, Pharaoh. <laughs> and the point of this, if you resist and you don't get this message clearly, God's going to bring your kingdom down. And you go, why did he give him a staff? Because the Egyptian kingdom had a mindset that shepherds were the lowest of the low. <laughs> you know, they were walking around. You see all these Egyptian uh, inscriptions, and all of them got these, uh, you know, these scepters, and they're carrying around swords, and they're carrying around all these ornate things in their hands that represent power and authority. You don't take a shepherd's crook. You don't take a staff, a shepherd's staff, and bring down the greatest power of the time. But God did. God did. If this conventional wisdom is true that you've got to play to your strengths, then Paul, the Pharisee of the Pharisees, would not have sent, been sent by God to be the apostle to the Gentiles. This one causes me to chuckle on the inside the most. You need to understand that before Saul of Tarshish had his conversion experience, this guy was wound up so tight. He dripped a religious spirit. He oozed a religious spirit. He was one of these guys where you walk into the church and he, he's measuring everybody up on whether they are going to make it or not. He's the Bible answer man before the Bible answer man got on the radio. Do you hear what I'm saying? He's the one who identifies what's a cult and not a cult. He is this guy that he, he has his stuff sewed together. And he's never defiled himself. And he's got all of his phylacteries on. He's identified as being what he himself said. He self-identified himself as a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was religious down to the tip of his toenails. And God says, I'm thinking about sending someone that's going to open up the frontiers of missions to the Gentiles. Those pork-loving, <laughs> unclean-eating, unwashed masses, idolatry-worshipping gen Gentiles. Most religious Pharisees had never been in a Gentile home. They didn't want to talk even to Gentiles. They saw a Gentile, they would, you're not going to get close to me to touch me because I'm clean and you're not. <laughs> How many of you know Paul did not play to his strength? <laughs> You think he was uncomfortable the first time they had a fellowship dinner? <laughs> oh my, he had to get free. Amen. Come on, I'm preaching better than you're amen and me. The first time somebody said, Paul, have you ever had pulled pork? We've smoked this for 12 hours. Woo, this melts in your mouth. And he goes, uh-uh, no, uh-uh, no. Now, wait a minute, preacher. You said that God has called us clean. And that it's not about meat and food being the consistency of the kingdom, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Well, I feel the joy of the Lord when I eat this. So why don't you have communion with me and have some of this? I'm sure it stretched Paul right out of his comfort zone. But he got there. 
Matter of fact, this Pharisee, the Pharisee got so free that when Peter came up there, he was saying, Peter, come on over for the fellowship dinner, dude. I've received breakthrough in a lot of things that I've not had breakthrough in. And what I thought were the majors, I find out they're the minors. And I find that God is doing things in these people that I never would have dreamed to do. It's because Paul was sent by God. Then you had a blue-collar fisherman, uneducated, that was sent to guys like Paul. Highly educated. Rabbinical schools. The Jewish people were were studious, and and they were a people that knew every jot and tittle uh, tittle of the law. And then God says, and I'm going to send Paul to the Gentiles, and I'm going to send this fisherman, blue-collar worker to the Jews. And I'm going to have him preach in the Sanhedrin itself. This is like me, a country preacher, going to Harvard and preaching at the Harvard Theological Seminary. (laughs) Oh, I would love to do it. (laughs) Where they're there with their glasses, you know, assessing, what is this man going to share with me? Thank God Peter stood up and got out of his comfort zone and he went and he preached in places that he, you would have never have thought that he would give witness to the gospel. Okay, my wife went to the piano, so we better stand. How many are ready for God to take you out of your comfort zone? Amen. Good, two of you. <laughs> I, I encourage the rest of you to come back to service at 1030 <laughs> to hear it one more time. I'd like the prayer teams to come up, if you will. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This last week, I went to uh, serve the city luncheon on Thursday, and they had a brother that was there sharing, and he, he was talking about the Great Commission. He talked about the four verbs of the Great Commission. And the last one was, it said, teaching them to observe or to obey. And he said, we have twisted the Great Commission to make it teaching for information, not teaching for obedience. And today, some of you need to act upon this word in faith, but then that faith translate into obedience to say, God, I need you to get me out of my comfort zone. And so today, if the Holy Spirit is challenging you, saying, Holy Spirit, I've surrendered controls, but I've tried to stay right where I'm at. You need to pray. You need to seek God. You need to have other people that can be a catalyst to pray for you, to partner with your faith so that God can get you out of that prison, that comfort zone of that place where you just say, I'm comfortable right here. And I want to pray for us all now. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that this word, which we've tried to present in a humorous way, but Holy Spirit, we hear your challenge to us. We hear your challenge to this church to say, don't get too comfortable. 
that you're calling us out and you're calling us forth to obey you in ways in which we've never obeyed you before. And Holy Spirit, we want to say that even though we know that that can be frightening to our flesh, Holy Spirit, we ask that there would be a breath of your wind that comes upon our life to carry us forth out of where we've been. We say our hands are your hands, our mouth is your mouth, our feet are your feet. We say that we will speak, we say that we will do, we say that we will go wherever you want us to go. And we ask for it. We ask for that empowering of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.